I'm Tiffany Windsor, and I'd like to welcome you to Cool to Craft, the coolest place to join in and get inspired with creative ideas. For those of you who are joining us for the first time here on the Cool to Craft channel, let me say welcome. If you are joining us during our live Monday chat time, be sure to introduce yourself right now in the chat room if you have not already done so. After each of today's demos, you will be able to ask questions about the projects right here live in the chat room. Even if you have a few questions during the demos, that's okay too. My one request is please keep your chats on topic because we have a lot to share today. The theme of today's show is vintage. Ask a handful of your friends what vintage means to them and you'll get as many answers as you have friends. For some, it might bring up images of Victorian, to others it's old family photos, and to some it's collectibles. In the 19th century, vintage began to be used to signify something being old, old-fashioned, classical, or from another time. So vintage can definitely take on a different meaning to each of us. Type styles, fabric prints, imagery, collectibles, and techniques can all be labeled as vintage. So I guess what I'm seeing is that antique, vintage, and retro is just a matter of our own personal perspective. Whatever you call it, I think that vintage is super cool. For me, vintage brings up memories of many of my mother Aline's vintage crafting projects. I love looking through the hundreds of all of her old instruction books. Now these are from the 1950s and 1960s. You know, she started in business in the 1940s, but these booklets didn't start until a few years into her business. So there's lots of great ideas in here that are really inspiring. They're super cool. Did I mention that? Back in the 1960s, my mother, Aline, and her designers developed some super cool creative techniques using aluminum foil by scrunching it all up and applying it to all sorts of surfaces, you could create the look of forged metal. In celebration of our vintage theme on today's show, my sister Eco Heidi is here to share a look of forged metal box. Hi everyone. Today I'm gonna to show you a really fun technique. It's a vintage technique from Mama Aline it's taking aluminum foil and making it look like it's forged metal. It's fun, it's easy, let's get started. This definitely has to be one of my favorite vintage techniques. Taking aluminum foil and making it look like it's forged metal. This is the box I'm going to show you how to do, of the technique I'm going to show you how to do. And notice this texture right here. I'm going to show you how to do that, um, get that texture so it looks like it's forged metal. So the first thing that you need is you need some aluminum foil and you're going to scrunch it up and don't put it into a ball because it's kind of hard to get it out of, of the ball so just kind of scrunch And then open it up a little bit. And then I take a brayer and I just roll it out. And you could take a jar, you could take anything that would, uh, just a rolling pin, just something that will roll it out. Now if, if you want more scrunch, just kind of go back again. And then again, Roll it out, and you're ready to cover a box or whatever your project is. Now, I'm doing a small box. This is just a small wood box that I got at my craft store. And um, so be sure that you, when you scrunch your foil, that you scrunch it where it's large enough to cover your box. So I start with my lid, and on top of my lid, I'm putting this corrugated cardboard. It's one of those hot sleeves from one of the coffee. This one's Starbucks. See? <laughs> and you're going to you're going to glue it down on the top of your the box lid. Okay. 
and just put a little bit of glue press it in onto the box now this is what's going to give us that dimension and let's say you want to do something you want some other ideas for dimension there's always like this wonderful uh, trim one a trim that has like a little bit more texture or look at this one here this really thick cording you can also use like um, clothesline you can use lace you could even use washers metal washers you could use uh, the nuts and bolts and you could use jewels so look around start looking around for things that you might want to use you know I could even put like a couple of these right here for a little bit more texture give me a, like that forged look that we're looking for okay so now I'm going to put I'm going to put glue all over the top looks like I need a little bit more glue under there and then and actually take a brush and kind of brush it into the grooves but you also don't want it to fill up the grooves so that you can't get that texture and I want some on the sides Okay, the foil has a shiny side and it has a dull side. So I'm going to put my glue side against the dull side. And I'm going to start pressing. You can help it with a pencil. You can also help it with a, a Q-tip. It's for all this wonderful texture from the corrugated cardboard. Can you see that? Oh, doesn't it look great? Oh, I love it. Now I want to start to push it around the edge. and you're going to have to trim the corners and anywhere that you want to push it down onto the box if you use a pencil something that will push it in and then I would put more glue inside put some glue on this trim it a little bit so that it'll fit and then do all the other sides remember you put glue around I want to be sure before we run out of time excuse me of time that we I show you how to paint it so I have my foil on and now I want to make it look like it's been forged or antiqued so I just have some black acrylic paint here and I'm just going to brush it on I 
I'm adding a little tiny bit of water to kind of help paint it on. And while it's still wet, you're just simply going to take a paper towel and wipe off the excess. And you can take as much as you want off. If you take too much off, you can always go back and put more on. I'm going to put a little bit on the sides. And let's take a look like right over here in this corner. You can kind of tell that it needs a little bit more. And there we have our top. I'm going to bring this one in that's finished to show you what I did on top of the, the box after I have it all finished. I took another piece of that corrugated cardboard. I painted it black with a little bit of rub and buff gold around it. And then I have all kinds of really cool uh, vintage buttons. There's a vintage clock here. And uh, then I also put uh, beads on for my legs. And it makes a really sweet metal looking box for just pennies. Isn't that fun? Thanks everyone. Several years ago, I became friends with Kathy Conomario, and it was love at first sight. Can I say that? I love her creative designs. I love her creative energy. She's the most amazing woman, and I'm so delighted to be able to call her my friend. Perhaps you've seen Kathy's work at her website, craftychica.com. Did you know that in addition to all of the amazing design work that Kathy makes, that she's also a writer? That's a writer as in novels, not as in craft instructions. <laughs> and today she has a big announcement. I'll let her tell you the big news, but I can reveal that the project that she's going to share today is vintage inspired from Daisy de la Flora. Who is that, you ask? Here's Kathy to tell you. Hi, Tiffany and everyone at Cool to Craft. It's Kathy from CraftyChica.com. And today is an exciting day for me because it is the release of my second novel called Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing. And Tiffany, when I heard you were doing a vintage themes show, I knew I had to contribute to this because in the book I have a very crafty character named Daisy de la Flora. And she was a handbag designer from the 1960s. And she was inspired by all the crazy stylings of Carmen Miranda. And there's a little bit of mystery in the story, but um, my inspiration for Daisy de la Flora was actually Enid Collins of Texas. Remember those um, cool purses? They're collectibles now where all of the different gems are glued onto them. So I made some Daisy de la Flora purses. And I'm going to show you, ooh, where are they? there they are, okay, <laughs> I'm going to show you how I made these so that you can make them too. And um, if you like the project, check out the book. There are a bunch of crafty characters in there, a lot of sparkly gems sewing. It's called Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing. In my new novel, Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing, there's a character by the name of Daisy de la Flora. She was a famous designer in the 1960s who used a lot of gems and crystals to embellish purses and boots and all kinds of things. My inspiration for the character was Enid Collins, the famous purse designer from Texas from the 1960s. So what I'm going to do now is make a Daisy de la Flora inspired handbag. 
And think of kind of um, Enid Collins with a dash of Mambo Spice. And here are my crystals and my gems that I'm going to be using. This is a cool little technique that I did. I took my dimensional paint, my fabric dimensional paint, and I made little dots on my silicone mat. And then I put little gems inside of them and I let them dry because, you know, sometimes when you're using the dimensional paint, you don't exactly know where you want to put it. And what this does is this gives me these cute little embellishments that I can place wherever I want and I can try them out before I actually glue them down. So what I'm going to use to glue all of this I'm going to use my Tulip Glitter Dimensional Fabric Paint because it acts as an adhesive and it will also give everything a nice glittery silver background to it. I also have some vintage jewelry pieces here that I thought would be kind of cute to put in and some little charms, some little, um, they look like Bollywood inspired stickers so these are pretty cool and some regular stickers and some cool little gems so here's my inspiration here's another Enid bag I actually collect these bags but um, I'm just going to use that just as a kernel of inspiration because I really want this to be a Daisy de la Flora bag and she has her completely own style so I'll come back and let you know And here we have the final projects. Look, this is a finished purse, and I did a second one also. And I didn't use every single item I had, but there's still a lot on there. I'm very happy with them. They remind me of what Daisy De La Flora would make if she were alive. <laughs> and again, Daisy De La Flora is a character in my new book, Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing, a Crafty Chica novel, on sale March 7th. Actually, you can get it right now online at Barnes & Noble or on Amazon. And if you have any more questions, visit my site at CraftyChica.com. Okay, so I hope you like my project. I hope you get to make a purse. I hope you get to read my new book out today. Anyway, thanks Tiffany. Back to you. Oh my gosh, I love, love, love those purses, Kathy. They're amazing. I can't wait to try that. Please join me in sending Kathy congratulations on her new novel. Head on over to her Facebook fan page or her website and say hi to her. And be sure and tell her that Cool to Craft sent you. Candace J, the creative play muse here at Cool to Craft, is digging into her great-grandmother's buttons for a vintage-inspired bracelet. Hi, and welcome to my studio. Today I'm going to show you how to make a quick and easy vintage button bracelet using my great-grandmother's buttons. I just love that I inherited my great-grandmother's buttons. I love going through them and looking at all the really cool shapes and shells and bone buttons and glass ones even. These are the buttons that I've chosen for the bracelet project. These small ones will be spacers. And I got some bead accents, a really good bead embroidery thread, a nice beading needle, and I have this stretchy brown ribbon that I'm going to sew them onto. Just like any button sewing project, I'll come up through the bottom of the material, through the bottom of the button, and because the button on top has holes, I'm going to pick up some accent beads as well because I don't want the thread to show. And these look really cool. So then I'm going to put them here and go back down through. Make sure I'm in the same place, yes. And just like any other button sewing project, I'll want to go through several times, make several passes with the thread. 
You can even go back up through the beads again if you have a narrow enough needle. And then back down through. And I'm going to tie each one off individually so that the thread doesn't break when it's stretched. I'm just going to tie a knot, snip the thread, and move on to the next one. When you go to sew the second button on, you want to place it where it looks like it's going to touch. So I've already come through with my thread, and this will be one of the beads, one of the buttons that doesn't get a bead accent because it doesn't have the holes in the top. But it's certainly the same method. Let's just go back down through the ribbon. See, they touch like that. But when you put them on, there's a space, and that's why you need the spacer beads. Now that I have three of the large buttons on, I've picked up one of the spacers. I picked up some beads there. And I love this button. It appears to be plastic. It's multicolored, and it's faceted, which I just love. It's obviously well-worn. And that's what the spacer beads buttons will look like. The bracelet is finished. I've sewn all the buttons and spacers on. And one of the things that I love about this bracelet is that it moves and it makes noise. That's one of my favorite buttons there. This is one that I've always loved but never thought I would find a use for and I had an extra space. So I was very pleased to sew it on. Now I know you or someone you know has a stash of buttons. Pull them out and have some fun. I enjoyed making this project today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you make one. And I hope I get to see it. Thanks. So Candace, I know exactly what Heidi's doing right now. She's heading off to her button stash, and she's going to whip up some of those bracelets. Love that idea. So Candace and I were vibing on a similar vintage theme because we both had bracelets in mind. As I mentioned at the top of the show, when I think of vintage, what immediately comes to mind for me are the crafting techniques that my mother Elaine dreamed up starting back in the 1950s and the 1960s. One of my favorite techniques is eggshell mosaic, but I have a little confession for you. I must tell you that I haven't had much experience in playing with this technique because it seemed like it was a lot of very small, small pieces of eggshell on a big crafting surface, and I really never wanted to tackle that. So with my vintage-inspired technique today, I downsized it, brought it down into easy-to-complete size to create an eggshell mosaic bracelet. As a matter of fact, it was so easy, I decided to create two. The first step in creating your eggshell mosaic is to collect your eggshells. You can use white or brown eggs depending on what effect that you want to create in your finished project. I'm a fan of brown eggs. These I boiled and then took the shells off of the egg. And what they've been doing is actually soaking in water overnight because that helps you remove the membrane that's inside the eggshell. You can see here when I pull back, we can actually remove that membrane. If you don't remove that membrane and you go to glue these pieces down, the membrane will stick to the glue, but the eggshell won't. So just peel back and check to be sure that you have all of the membrane 
removed from inside the egg shells. Once you've removed the membrane, just take these shells and put them on a piece of paper towel and let them dry overnight. Here are some shells that have been drying overnight and you can hear that they're dry because they have a very crisp sound to them in the bowl. You will want to start to break them into pieces to use for your eggshell mosaic. For the bracelet that I'm creating today, I'm just using a resin piece for the base. You can certainly use wood or other hard surfaces to glue your eggshell pieces on. The next step is to apply your tacky glue to the surface. And I just use my finger to spread it around. You want a nice even coat all the way out to the edges. There are a couple of different techniques that you can use to apply your eggshells. First, it's just laying down the individual pieces, very much in a regular mosaic pattern. Or you can take some of your larger pieces, place them down, and press them with your finger, and you'll hear them start to crack and that pushes it right into the glue. If you want to, you can move them around a little bit to give them some space in between, but that covers up a large area at one time. Don't worry if some of the pieces hang over the edge slightly. You can fix that once the glue has dried. Continue to add your eggshell pieces until you have the pattern that you want on your piece. Use those little tiny pieces to go in between some of the larger pieces. If you don't like handling these small pieces of eggshell, just use some tweezers. And that way it'll be easy for you to place the eggshell pieces right where you want them. As you can see, I've left some of these pieces hanging over the edges. And as I mentioned, I can wait till the glue is dry or I can break them off now. Any of the sharp edges we can sand after the glue has dried. Now that you have all of your pieces glued in place, set this aside for a couple of hours to dry or let it set overnight. Now that my eggshell pieces have dried completely, it's time to color them. Before I color, I'd like to check my edges to see if there's any pieces hanging over. I see that there is a piece here, so I am going to break it off just with my fingernail. And we can come back and sand if there's any sharp edges that are left. I'm using alcohol ink to color. And I apply my ink directly over the entire surface.
Continue to color each of your pieces the same way and let the alcohol ink dry completely. Once your alcohol ink has dried completely, it's time to sand back some color. And I take a sanding block and lay it on the table and run my piece over the surface of the sanding block. And you can see how that starts to lift some of the color. Be sure that you ink the sides and the back of each of your jewelry resin pieces. And then my final step is to add a beautiful, clear gloss finish to the top. You can use the type that you apply and it just dries overnight to that clear finish, or you could use the UV glossy finish where you put it under a UV light, which accelerates the drying time to about 15 minutes. I love the look on how that really brings out the texture and design of the eggshell pieces while giving it a smooth finish. What I also did is I took just white craft pearls and I also inked them up with the same color of alcohol ink so that they would match perfectly to create my bracelet. And because they have that beautiful pearlized finish to them, the alcohol ink also picks up and reflects that pearl so you can make a beautiful coordinated color bracelet. I have used my beading wire and some beads and a closure to finish off the bracelet. I suggest you start saving your eggshells because I can tell you that this is really really addictive. I am going to start wrapping up today's show, but stick around for a few minutes because there are some announcements coming right up. Thank you to my super cool guests on today's Cool to Craft. My sister Eco Heidi Borchers created this Aline's Vintage Inspired Look of Forged Metal Box. Kathy Cono Murillo, also known as the Crafty Chica, announced the release of her new book, Miss Scarlet's School of Patternless Sewing. You go, girl! Candace J. transformed her grandmother's vintage buttons into a beautiful bracelet. And I got you hooked on eggshell mosaic, also vintage Aline's. Okay, so maybe you're not hooked yet, but you will be. If you enjoyed today's show, please stop by the Cool to Craft Facebook fan page and leave a comment on that page or head on over to cooltocraft.com to check out all of the cool ideas and sign up for our giveaways or just drop by to hang out. Get creative, get inspired, be cool. Bye! You're invited! Sign up today for the Cool to Craft newsletter from FadeCrafts.com. It's an easy way to have new, creative, and crafty ideas delivered right to your email inbox, featuring photo and instruction tutorials from your favorite crafting hosts and designers, along with featured videos, favorite picks, giveaways, and more. It's a great follow-up to each week's Cool to Craft channel shows. Sit back and enjoy the creative ideas we bring to life. Go to cooltocraft.com to sign up today.